Um, everything is connected now, so let's uh, give it a go from the from the get go. My name is Faisal Um There's a few things that I'm interested in, mostly surrounding startups. Uh, primarily, it's technology, psychology, and business. Um, there isn't much to mention here, but I've worked with a number of startups, uh, mostly in the technology space, the biggest of them being Shutterstock, uh, specifically in a branch called Shutterstock Custom. There are a bunch of interesting things over there. Uh, beginning of this year, came to visit some friends, and as you all know, all the flights got stopped, so I decided to kind of move back here and, and uh, check out the tech scene. Um, today's session goals are going to be discussing a few of the key metrics that are related to startups. Now, these startups could be SaaS businesses, so software as a service, it could be e-commerce businesses, or it could be just general things um, that, such as like online products. So, for example, if you, have, uh, if you have a software that you're selling online and you want to be able to track things, sometimes it's just simply not enough to look at revenue. So, we're going to be discussing some of the key metrics that we can look at to find out where in the funnel um, we can improve and, and how we can make things right and also how to get the maximum value out of all the advertising that we're doing and out of all the activities that we're doing. Um, all right, so the first thing that we're going to discuss is why are these things important? So, I mean, you could, you could kind of ask the question, why can't I just track revenue at the, at the bottom line and check if my startup is doing well? And the simple answer to that is if you, if you only do that, then what, what's going to happen is you're not going to know how to fix things, you're not going to know how to pivot your strategy. So you might be spending like $10,000 on ads, and then you might be losing a bunch of customers, which means your, your bottom line is not going to change. And you're going to think that you're doing okay, but in reality, you're just doing all of these extra efforts for, for no reason. So the idea is not just to see if, if you're making more money. The idea is that we're tracking progress and we're pivoting strategy using data. The idea is how do we inform our decisions with information that we're getting from, from our usage or from our customers. So let's dive uh, right into it. Um, we'll talk about like what are the, what are the metrics that we want to be able to track. Um, and then we're, we're going to go further into each of the metrics that we're going to be discussing. One thing to keep in mind uh, before going into any of these eight metrics is, A, there are a lot more metrics than, than what we're going to discuss today. So it's not limited to what we are discussing today. That's number one. Um, number two, you don't have to track all of these things. Like, don't, don't think that, hey, if I'm not tracking any of these things, then I'm falling behind. No, the idea is to figure out a few metrics that matter to you and use them in order to inform your strategy. It's, the point is not to track everything uh, because eventually if you do try to track everything, you're just going to be ending up in a situation where you're just tracking things without actually making any decisions or without actually improving your business essentially even ignoring your, your existing customers. Um, so let's get to it. The first thing that we're going to discuss is something called customer acquisition costs. Uh, we're going to go from that into customer lifetime value. And we're going to see how some of these things are connected to one another. Then we're going to talk about how customers stick around and how they leave and how do we measure that and, and, and the impact of them leaving on the business. Then we're going to talk about some monthly recurring revenue and annual recurring revenue. Uh, also, things like measuring virality and stickiness of the of the product, um, and then finally, we're gonna wrap up with activation and uh, and burn rates. So let's get started with the first one: customer acquisition costs. So the idea here is we want to be able to answer the question of how much do I pay to get a new customer? And when I say a new customer here, I mean a new paying customer. An example of this would be, let's say, you run a social media ad. Uh, or your budget for social media ads in general is $500 a month, which I know is really small, but I just wanted to keep the, the math simple here. Um, so let's say you're paying $500 a month, and then for those $500 a month, you're getting 10,000 views um, also per month. That means you're basically paying $0.05 cents per view, or this is your, your cost per view, cost per click, however you want to call it. Um, but that's still not conversion, so we have to dig a little bit deeper. Out of those 10,000 views, let's say you're getting a uh, 1,000 signups. So that means you have 10% activation if you consider signup to be an activation, and we'll talk about activations later. But so the funnel so far is like, I spent $500 on social media. I got 10,000 views. Out of those 10,000 views, I got 1,000 signups. And then finally, out of those, I got 500 paying active users. So that means my final, my final thing is a 5% conversion rate because pay, a paying user is what we call a converted user. Um, and that also means that for every dollar that I'm spending, I'm getting one user. 
So the math here kind of works out in a, in a really nice way. It probably wouldn't be the case in real life, but that is my customer acquisition cost. That means for me to turn somebody who does not know about the business into a paying user, I have to pay a dollar. And I have to pay a dollar in this example within social media ads. So remember this, my, my customer acquisition cost is now a dollar. The next thing that is kind of related to customer acquisition cost is called customer lifetime value. The idea of customer lifetime value is to measure how much for the entire duration of this customer sticking around or being with, uh, with your service or, or purchasing your service, buying your product, however you, you, you're selling it, um, what is the total amount of money that they're paying? So if we want to take an example where the customer sticks around for, for four months, let, let's actually say that we have a subscription model and uh, we sell boxes of chocolates. It's a subscription for selling boxes of chocolates. And uh, this box of chocolates costs $100 a month. And on average, the customer sticks around for four months. So they come in, they start the subscription, um, they stick around for four months, and then after four months, they leave. And this is an average value. So this doesn't mean that every customer is doing this. So some might be doing a little bit more, some might be doing a little bit less. So you get that average value of, of the lifetime the, in, in months. And then you multiply that by how much the average customer pays per month. And then that ends up being your customer lifetime value. Okay. And then in relation to, in relation to customer acquisition costs, your customer lifetime value has to always, always be larger than your customer acquisition cost. So in this example, if we're paying a dollar to get every new customer, then, and we're making $400 out of them, then that means our customer lifetime value minus customer acquisition cost is, let's say, 399 So that's good. Um, generally speaking, you should aim for 10x customer lifetime value compared to customer acquisition cost. Because if these values are basically the same, then you're just kind of spinning your wheels in the same place. You're, you're just um, paying all these ad dollars, you're getting these customers, but they're not sticking around long enough, uh, they're leaving too quickly, and then you're not making any progress. Uh, does this make sense so far? Let's, uh, let's check the chat. I think there's a few messages here. Integrated content. Okay, great. If possible, can we switch to the webcam? We're going too fast. Don't worry if it's time on. Okay, sure, no problem. Um, that sounds good. So I'll I'll just recap. I'll try to recap um, every every two metrics. So this way we can kind of have a review of what's going on. So just now, just before this, we talked about customer acquisition cost. Customer acquisition cost in English, in just simple English, is how much do I have to pay to get a new paying customer? Um, this doesn't have to be on social media. Like you could literally just imagine banks. Banks, for example, sometimes what they would do is they would say, hey, if you open a new account with us, we're going to put $100 in your account, right? Like we're just going to start your account with $100. So that means that they know um, that their customer acquisition cost per single customer is $100. And you can imagine that this can get very, very extensive because if they want to get, let's say, a thousand new customers um, and they're giving $100 each, that means their total customer acquisition costs, um, not per customer, but like for the thousand customers, is going to be 100,000. So you can kind of start asking yourself, well, why does this make sense for a bank? And the simple answer is connected to the customer lifetime value. Generally speaking, we don't switch banks very often. So they know, banks know that their customer lifetime value is so long. It's not in, in months. It's probably in like maybe five or 10 years. Um, it's not more. Like we don't, we don't generally switch to banks. So they know that the $100, they can probably make it back 10x, even by asking you to pay $5 a month for all of their services. Uh, and that's why they're able to do something like giving you $100 as a, as a sign-up bonus. Okay? Um, yeah, so these, these two things are, are tightly coupled together um, and they can be applied to anything. Any, any activity that you do that you have to pay money for and that leads to a new paying customer goes under the customer acquisition cost, the total amount of money that the customer is paying over the lifetime of the subscription or of, of their connection with your service is called the customer lifetime value. Um, let's move forward and then maybe we can circle back. By the way, you've noticed that all of these metrics are somehow connected to, to one another. Like you, you will notice that no metric is just going to be in and of itself and just like hanging around. You'll notice that somehow 
they build on each other. And, and this is going to go back to something we're going uh, to speak about at the end, which is a, a funnel. All right. Um, this one is pretty straightforward. Customer retention, customer loyalty. It's basically how long does a customer stay loyal to my service? Like how, how often, not how often, sorry, how long do they stay loyal to my service? And the idea of retention is, we always want retention to be as good as possible. And the reason for that is because it allows us to focus on existing customers and making sure that the service that we're giving them is pretty good. Because if our retention is bad, that means we have to do a lot of customer acquisition. And if our customer acquisition equals our retention, uh, it goes back to the whole point of like not, not making any progress and our bottom line being stagnant and staying the same. The opposite of customer loyalty is something we call churn. Uh, churn, or, or basically in, in English, how many customers am I losing each month, is something that is generally associated with software as a service products or things that are monthly subscriptions. And the reason for that is because churn is easy to measure in those scenarios. So going back to our example of selling uh, this box of chocolate every month, the moment that somebody cancels their subscription, we can consider them a churned user. We can say that, hey, they are no longer participating in the, in the offering that we have, so they are now a churned user. However, one thing to note is not every, like not every churn is 30 days. You don't have to necessarily use uh, the monthly churn as your period of time. It could depend on your type of business. Because let's say you don't have a subscription business. Like let's say you're just a business like uh, Noon, where you, you sell things in, in, uh, in a, in a one-off kind of setup and it's not a subscription. Then maybe your churn is the customer not buying anything for the next three months. So you have to kind of be flexible with setting this churn period because it depends on your type of business. And this goes to the, to the concept of inactive users. Like you can't confuse inactive users with churned users. Churned users are not coming back. That's it, they're gone. Um, versus inactive users where they're just, the purchasing habits are slightly different and they might not want to buy as many things from you or, or rather as frequently. Um, so even with the subscription stuff, you might have subscriptions that are quarterly, you might have subscriptions that are yearly. Um, so you have to be careful with this churn thing because it, it has to be something that is generic enough um, such that it works for your business rather than always using it as, uh, as a monthly thing. And generally, it is a percentage. So let's, uh, let's look at an example of how we can measure churn. So let's say that at the start of the year, January 1st, uh, we had 10,000 users. Okay, and these are 10,000 subscribed users, they're paying users. Uh, we're, we're not considering non-paying users at the moment. Uh, and then from January till the end of March, we've had a thousand drop-offs. So a thousand people came into the website or the app or whatever it is, and then they said, hey, I want to cancel my subscription. I am no longer interested. So the way we calculate churn in this case would be uh, 1,000, which is how many people dropped off, divided by what we started with, which is 10,000. And that would equal to 10%. Now, because we're measuring from January all the way till March, which is a quarter, we would call this a quarterly churn. Um, now, if your business has been running long enough, you can do this yearly, uh, or if the activity itself is frequent enough, then you can potentially even do this daily. So I'm just stressing out the fact here that the time frame is dependent on your type of business rather than um, something that is fixed. But generally speaking, monthly is, is a good way to, to go about it. Um, okay, so one way to visualize churn uh, which is a little bit more involved, is something called cohort analysis. And with cohort analysis, what we do is we basically say, for the start of January, um, I've had 297 people sign up. Okay, and this is, this is the, the top left uh, cell, 297 people sign up. And then what you would do is you would say, for those people who signed up in January, what, how many of them remained on the platform, on the service, on the subscription, whatever it is, over time. So how many of them remain for the second month, which is February? How many of them remain for uh, March? And so on and so forth. And that is the first row that you're seeing. It is not the first column. So in this example, we start with 297 people, and then they become 295, 293, 291, and so on and so forth. Um, you kind of find over time that this number will uh, pretty much always go down. 
Uh, and the reason for that is because whoever signed up in, Je in January, um, you're making the assumption here that they're not coming back because we said churn is the user saying, I know I'm no longer interested in your service. If they do come back, you could, for example, consider them as uh, an entirely different customer which signed up on a different month. So let's say February, um, we have 313 and so on and so forth until we get to the current month. Um, in which case you only have one month to go with, and that's why you're seeing this um, kind of a triangle shape uh, where in each, like you're basically looking backwards. So if we're in June now or July now, and then we're looking backwards six months, then we have six cells for January, five cells for February, so on and so forth. Um, this is all, by the way, from this idea of uh, lean metrics. So if you're trying to dive deeper into this and, and see what's going on, it's something that you can uh, look into. I'm going to pause here for a second, and I'm going to perhaps take some questions. Um, so as we don't go too fast, I'll open up the chat. Are there any questions so far? Okay. How do we track churn in B2B products? Well, it would follow the same, the same kind of approach, right? Like the only difference here is instead of the, the customer being a, a single customer, your customer is effectively a business. So if it's a subscription that you're offering to other businesses, let's, let's actually take an example. So let's say you have accounting software and your accounting software costs a hundred dollars a month. And basically your, your, your customers are not individuals. They're potentially businesses. So you can apply the same approach where you say, you know, I have 297 businesses that signed up in January. And by the time it's June, out of those who signed up in January, and that's the cohort part, right? Like that's where what we, we are defining as a cohort or a group. We're basically saying that is my January cohort. How many of them remained with my monthly subscription for this accounting software all the way till June? And then out of the February cohort, how many of them remained all the way till June? And so on and so forth until you get to the June cohort where you only have one month of data and, and that's not very useful to look at. Um, now, you could define these activities in different ways, like it doesn't have to be necessarily a monthly subscription, it could be something that is entirely different. So let's say if you generate your money from ads being shown on your website, it could be like how many times the same user came back and did some activity on my website. Um, we're also not considering the trial period, just for, again, for SaaS products specifically, like if you have a trial period. Um, during the trial period, the customer is not considered a paying customer. So um, if, they, if they don't sign up after the trial ends, we don't consider them in the churn charts. Are there any indicative benchmark churn rates for different business types? Yeah, there, there's probably like different kind of bases for what is a good amount of churn. Um, obviously, as a general rule of thumb, you're trying to minimize this as much as possible. And you can also compare it to how many new customers you're getting. So let's say, let's make it as generic as possible. Um, we want to be able to reduce churn, especially in relation to the number of new customers that we're getting, because this, this kind of connects with the idea of retention. Um, so remember that churn is the opposite of retention. We want to keep customers as much as possible. So if your churn is higher or equal to your customer acquisition, or even close to it, like even, even if it is lower, but close to it, then that's probably a signal that something is not right. That's probably a signal that your users um, are not going to stick around long enough for your business to grow to a, to a sufficient stage. Um, what are typical churn metrics for different industries? So we know if our metrics are better or worse for industry averages. Um, that's something I can send later. Like I can, uh, I can definitely look that up for different uh, industries. But if you do have something specific, like if you are in a specific industry, let me know, and I can, I can definitely find that up for you. Um, generally speak, generally speaking, you don't want it to be more than 10%. Like it, it's, it's not like if it's more than 10% of your, if you're losing more than 10% of your users on a monthly basis, that is a very, very bad signal because that means that you have to at least gain 
10% of your user of, of like your entire user base every month, which is a lot of work. So you want this to be almost like 2%, I would say, as a, as a general rule of thumb, unless it's a different kind of business. And also this goes back to how you define churn. So if you're the type of business where the customer only needs to purchase from you once a month for every, or let's say once every quarter, then you can't look at just like monthly and then assume that they're churning. So that's another thing to keep in mind. Um, I think differentiating churn from royalty is easier for subscriptions versus non-subscriptions. Um, I think here's loyalty. So I think differentiating churn from loyalty is easier for subscriptions than non-subscriptions. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I think that's definitely something that is much more frequently used for subscription-based businesses. Um, but you can also look at like, you can also look at it for non-subscription businesses in terms of like how many users are coming back. So even if you're a restaurant, let's say, and um, you're not expecting people to like have subscriptions with your, with your business, you can look at like how often they come back or whether they come back at all. So you can define a period and that period could be again, dependent on your type of business. So you can say like, if they never came back for three months, then I'm gonna consider that a churned user. Right, and and that's that's something that is um, going to be related to uh, monthly recurring revenue and annual recurring revenue when we talk about it. And I'm going to show you how you can calculate it for non-subscription type businesses. Okay, let's uh, let's keep going. All right, uh, great. So that's the next point up. Uh, monthly recurring revenue, annual recurring revenue. So this is something that was mentioned in the chat just now. Like these are all things that you can kind of very clearly see how they are applicable to SaaS and subscription-based businesses, but they do also apply to non-subscription businesses. Um, the idea of MRR and ARR is how much does the average user spend each month or each year or each period on an ongoing basis? Uh, and the idea here is that it's measured by looking uh, at the spending of the customer per month on a recurring basis. Recurring basis here is the, is the highlight term. Um, so let's look at an example. Let's say we have uh, an e-commerce store that sells subscriptions for a Lifetime magazine. Uh, probably nobody does that, so I'm not sure this is a very realistic example of a magazine, but um, still the, the math should be indicative of, of the point here. So let's say we have a thousand paying customers, okay? And 450 of those sign up for the standard subscription, which is $10 a month. And then we have 200 that sign up for the uh, premium subscription, which is $20 a month. And then we have like generally 350 on average that just make one-time purchases, um, which means it's not a subscription. It is, it is just like they come, they try it, and then they, they drop out. They never come back. So in this case, our monthly recurring revenue should ignore the 350 that is that are not making subscriptions. We should only calculate for the recurring revenue, we should only calculate the ones that are actually subscribed or coming back to, to make another purchase. Um, in this case, it would be 450 times the, the $10 and then add that with 200 times the $20 for the premium subscription, which uh, will give us a final of 8,500 monthly recurring revenue. Um, Non-recurring is ignored. Now, Circling back to the question that was just asked, it's like, okay, well, what if I, I don't have a subscription business? Like, how can I make use of some of these values? In this case, what you can do is you can look at something called the repurchase rate. Uh, and the repurchase rate here tries to like simulate how often it is that your customers are coming back and purchasing something. And that period, I'm really stressing out here that the period depends on um, your type of business. So let's assume that we're, we're going with quarterly here, and let's say that we have 300 unique customers um, that purchased from the period of January all the way till the end of March, and 200 of those purchases were just one time. Like they came in, they bought what they needed, and then they left. 20 of those purchases, uh, or 20 of those customers purchased twice, and then 30 of those customers purchased five times during that period of time. So what I wanna measure here is basically how many of my customers are recurring customers. And this kind of, one of the methods of calculating this would basically ignore, um, ignore the fact that they made you know, two purchases or they made five purchases. The only thing I care about here is that they came back to purchase uh, in order for me to consider a, a recurring customer or to consider them a recurring customer. So I'd add all of the customers that made more than one purchase 
and I would divide that by the total number of customers that I have. In this case, it would give me 16.7% recurrent customers. So I know that 16.7% of my customers are recurring. Now, if I want to calculate the, uh, the sales value, so if I want to cal calculate a dollar value, you can do something similar by basically adding, adding up the, the, the multiplication of 20 times 2, because it's 20 people who purchased twice, plus 30 times 5, 30 people that purchased five times, and then you divide that by the total number of purchases that happened, regardless what, whether they were recurring or not. So you would basically say how many recurring purchases divided by the total number of purchases, and that would give you the recurring purchase rate itself in terms of the purchases themselves, not in terms of the, the customers. So in one method, we are basically ignoring the fact that they made two or more. We just know that it's recurring. And then in another scenario, we're basically saying we, we actually care about the, the actual value of the, of the recurrence. Um, generally speaking, I'm, I'm a huge proponent and a huge fan of subscription-based businesses. Uh, and there's a lot of advantages to that. One of them is that you can predict demand. Um, it's not just the fact that you're, you're having recurring revenue. It's the fact that you're predicting demand. And then if you do it really well, I think a lot of businesses kind of you know, make, make decent profits with, with that kind of approach. Um, but then other than just the profits, they can actually, they don't have to carry as much inventory. They don't have to, to, um, to live in an unknown kind of state. They, they can predict how much demand there is for the next period of time. Uh, and as I said, if you do it well, then you can end up like, uh, like Ash Ketchup or whatever this guy's name is. Uh, okay. Let's, uh, let's keep going. I think that I keep anything. No. Okay. Uh, virality and net promoter score. Okay, so in this case, what we're trying to answer in, uh, in plain English is how likely am I to get new customers from my existing customers? Um, in just simple terms, we're basically saying like, what is, what is the word of mouth factor? Um, but we're trying to measure it as much as possible. And there's two ways to measure this. Um, there's NPS and then there's vi virality uh, score or virality coefficient. We're going to start with NPS. Um, NPS is basically calculated in a very simple way. You ask your customers or you ask as many of your customers as possible from a scale of 1 to 10, how likely are you to recommend this product to a friend? And then if they tell you any value between 1 to 6, you uh, assume that they're called detractors and that means they're not going to do anything about it. They're, they might actually say bad things about your business. Um, and then if they, if they tell you seven to eight, some value, either seven or eight, then you assume that they're passive, that they're probably not going to say anything bad, but they're also not going to, you know, really promote your business. But if they do say nine or 10, then you consider them promoters. And the way you would calculate net promoter score is you basically look at the percentage of your promoters, the people who gave you nine or 10, as a likelihood of recommending this to a friend, a minus the percentage of detractors. And then you just kind of look away from the passive because you assume that they're not going to really do anything. Um, so as an example, if we have 840 answers, so 840 uh, customers answered, this doesn't have to be the total number of customers you have, just the fact that this is the number that answered. Um, 100 of those said 1 to 6, so they're detractors. 370 said 7 to 8, and uh, 370 said 9 to 10. So the value here would be 370 over 840, which is the total, minus 100 over 840. Um, so your net promoter score would be 32.1%, or you can look at it as a, as a fraction, doesn't really make a difference. Now, if we kind of take a step back and look at whether this actually works, we're gonna notice that there's kind of a few, a few issues with it, because effectively, you actually don't know that them saying, yes, it's a nine out of 10 likelihood that I'm going to invite a friend, but that means that they're going to actually invite it, invite somebody. And also, even if they really like the product, they might not know anybody who will find this product useful, right? So um, it's kind of hard to tell for, like in, in, in reality, whether this score is going to translate to you actually getting more customers through the existing customers or not. And that is why um, you should probably not take NPS uh, too seriously, but if, if you are trying to kind of like reach out to your customers and, and find their sentiments, then it's kind of a better approach. Like if it's better if you use it as a way of figuring out how happy your customers are 
with your product or with your service rather than a measurement, a product measurement of how likely you are to get a new customer from existing customers. Okay, and that's something just to, to keep in mind. Um, so the question that you might have at this point is, okay, well, what is a better approach? Like, how can I actually find out the, the, the likelihood of me getting new customers from existing customers? One way to do that is to ask binary questions, like ask yes or no. Are you likely to, would you, would you recommend this or would you not recommend this? Um, that still gives you a sentiment, but it's a much easier way for the user to answer. But then if they say, yes, I would recommend uh, this product to a customer, actually give them a way to do that. Like actually give them some incentive for a referral and, and, and check if they would because then you're looking at an actual product action as opposed to just a random question that you're asking them or just a sentiment that you're, that you're getting as a response. Uh, we have a question here, so we'll look at it before going into virality coefficient. Look for Justin in case anyone is interested. Subscription doesn't. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks for sharing, uh, Victor. Okay, so Actually, any questions so far before we talk about virality coefficient? Okay, it looks like we're good. All right, I'll keep going. Now, another better way to measure the same, the same idea, the same thing that we're going after is a virality coefficient. And the way we would do that is still revolve around action. Like we, we still wanna give users a way to invite other users, but then we can measure that and kind of figure out for each customer that we have, or for each hundred customers that we have, how many uh, potential new customers can we get just from those without doing any advertising, without doing any extra work. Um, and that is the virality coefficient, which is measured as uh, the average invitations sent by users. So for every 100 users, what is the average number of invitations sent by a user? Multiplied by the conversion rate of the invitation. And that is basically saying for every 100 invitations that I send uh, or that my users send, how many of those invitations are going to end up resulting in paying customers? Uh, and an example of this, like with actual numbers that we can look at, is Let's say your product has uh, 500 active users and each of those users send one invitation on average, just keeping it simple. Uh, so that means for every 100, you're gonna send 100 invitations. For 500 users, you're gonna send on average 500 invitations. That still means that some of these users are gonna send none and some of them are gonna send more than one, but on average it's one. And out of all of those invitations, 50% of them lead to a new user, okay? So that means our viral coefficient would be 500 times 0 0.5. I got the 500 by saying that on average, um, for every 500 users, I get one invitation, so that's 500, multiplied by the 50%, which as a, as a fraction is 0 0.5. So that means I can potentially get 250 new users for each 500 existing users. Um, to make that itself a coefficient, we can divide the, the potential number of new users, 250, by 500, which are my existing users, and then that would give me a 0 0.5. So I am 50%, um, I'm 50 likely to grow, or, or I'm expected to grow by 50% uh, for each customer that I have. So each 10 customers would give me five, each 100 would give me 50, so on and so forth. Again, here is an example where the math is, is really simple. In real life, it probably wouldn't work like that. Like, I doubt that an invitation conversion rate is 50%. It's probably something that is much lower. And also another thing you can take into account is um, always try to give incentives for users to, to send out these invitations and try to make these incentives linked to an actual uh, a user converting. So if I send out an invitation and the invitation that I sent does not lead to anything, then maybe the, the, the incentive that you're, that you're giving out is now just wasted. So try to make the incentive related to an actual uh, conversion from the invitation. This will this will lead to a this will lead to a much more forethought by your users to as to who to invite. Okay, so this brings us to activation rate, and activation rate is not to be 
con uh, not to be confused with conversion rate. Conversion rate is when we take an activity that leads to a paying customer. Activation rate does not necessarily have to lead to a paying customer. The idea here is how can my users or how many of my users achieve partial success using my product? So for an e-commerce store, partial success could look something like adding something to a cart. Like that might be considered activation. Or for a SaaS product, it might be like signing up for a free trial. Um, so it's something that is that's happening before the conversion of a customer to, into a paying customer, but it is still something that is potentially indicative of them being interested in your product. Um, so if you let's go back to the e-commerce store, regardless whether it's a subscription or not, um, if if you run an ad campaign and somebody clicks on your on your ad and then goes to your website, maybe searches some stuff, adds something to the cart, that could be considered an activation because you're assuming here that the user at least potentially found what they're looking for from my website. Now, it could also tell you that if you have, let's say, a really high activation rate, so a lot of people are adding things to the cart, um, but nobody is actually and like nobody is actually paying, then this could this could tell you an area to drill down into. So, for example, it could tell you that maybe your checkout experience is not that great, or it could tell you, let's say, the the payment options that you're accepting are limited. Or it could tell you potentially, potentially your your prices are a little bit too high. Although I think that's a little bit of a stretch, um, but probably something in the step where they're going from I have stuff in my cart to I want to actually check out something over there is broken. Um, another way to measure this is basically as like a, a formula. You can just look at like the number of events that are desired. Um, so we said sign up or adding something to the cart divided by the total number of sessions. So out of everybody who came to my website, how many added to the cart, basically. Um, and that's, that's effectively what an activation rate is. It's really important to know that different businesses will have different ways of defining those activation rates. So there is no like, oh, this is like the one way to do it. It depends on what you're trying to get the user to achieve. So you have to think, what, what does partial success look like for my user? Or what does success up to the point of turning into a paying customer look like for my user. So far so good. I'm just going to check the chat quickly, make sure that uh, nobody has questions. Okay. All right. Okay, uh, finally, we're going to talk about something called burn rate. Uh, this one is a little bit self-explanatory, and it applies a lot to companies that need to spend money before actually reaching profitability. Um, so a lot of software businesses, what they need to do is they need to gain a lot of users in the, in the early phases before actually asking users to, uh, to purchase their product. So let's say you're launching, and let's say your trial period rate uh, for, for any reason is a month. Uh, and your your burn rate is higher than how many users you're converting into paying customers, then you have to be careful about like what that burn rate is because you're effectively in negative cash flow. Burn rate is basically another word for negative cash flow. Um, so you have to measure that, especially if you're a, a SaaS business, because effectively you're spending investor money and, and you have to be careful about how much of that you're investing. So for SaaS businesses, this could be a number of things like hosting uh, costs, or developer costs, and so on and so forth. Um, so by understanding your burn rate, you basically understand how long you have to live um, as a company before you can actually, or uh, before you have to start turning most of your users into paying customers. This one is relatively straightforward. Um, so what if we want to summarize most of this? Like, what if we want we don't we don't want to confuse ourselves with oh, there's all these like different metrics that I have to track. How can I set up the simplest possible framework for trying as many of these as uh, as I possibly can. And we can look at something called the Lean Startup Pirate Metrics. Uh, I've left a link in there, so hopefully once I share the, the whole presentation afterwards, you can check out uh, the Lean Startup. It's, a, it's kind of like a, a series of books um, made by Eric Ries. And in it, he talks about these five key things that you have to be looking at as a, as a as a software business or even as a subscription business. Potentially, you can even apply these to like a regular e-commerce store, um, where basically you have to look at number one, uh, act activation. So 
how do I engage users for them to at least find what they're looking for? They might not end up paying, but at least find what they're looking for. The second thing is acquisition. How do I uh, make sure that they're acquired users or how do I make sure that they're converted users and, and they've become paying customers? Um, how do I track revenue? This could be a recurring revenue. This could be non-recurring revenue. Um, we spoke a little bit about how we would track recurring revenue or, or recurring purchases for non-subscription businesses. Uh, and then finally, so, or, sorry, before finally, um, the last, the, the step before the last one is retention. How long am I keeping the users for? So even if I'm good at activating the users, I'm good at acquiring the users, they are paying me as a first step, but I'm not return, retaining them long enough. What's going to what's gonna happen is I'm going to have to spend a lot more time on the acquisition step. I'm going to have to keep acquiring new users in order to make sure that, uh, that my revenue is, is staying up. And then finally, what is my referral rate or, or what is my virality rate? We spoke about that as well. For each of those things, you can have different approaches for how you're measuring them. It doesn't have to all be the same. Um, but effectively, what we're doing here is we're saying these are the five key things that we're looking at. And if you're wondering why they're called pirate metrics, it's just what it's spelled. So like A-A-R-R-R, so R. And that, that was kind of like a, a funny play on words. Um, but yeah, so these are these are things that you should always be looking at. Uh, these are things that are uh, super important, uh, and you can define them differently depending on the type of business that you're running. Any questions so far? Okay. It looks like we're good. Okay, feel free, if, if you do have a question, feel free to just uh, jump into the chat and just uh, type your question over there. Um, the second to last thing that we're gonna go through, it's kind of a, a bonus thing here. It's not super, super related to a lot of the things that we're doing, but it is part of the whole new startup thing. Um, oftentimes when you're starting a startup, it doesn't make sense to like develop this whole long business model and, and like have a whole business plan just because it's like it's, it's really long um, and you make a lot of assumptions in it. So what, you, what you're trying to do, at least as a first step, is make it really clear, even if internally only, to yourself and to your co-founders and to the people that are working with you, what some of these really important areas are. So one of them, one of them could be the problem. Um, that you're trying to solve with your service. Another one could be the solution, unique value proposition, so on and so forth. Um, but as you can tell here, one of the one of the areas is called key metrics. Okay, and key metrics you can literally what you do to fill this out is you would take the uh, the the pirate metrics that we discussed, and then you would define for each one of those stages what a key metric for you is. So let's say for activation. For you could be like, okay, I want uh, I want users to come onto the website, uh, potentially either sign up or add to the cart. So I would define that as my activation. Acquisition is a user um, a user paying for their first uh, buy or for their first uh, month of the subscription, revenue, so on and so forth. Uh, you basically define different metrics for each of these stages or for each of these uh, uh, main KPIs. And then you would put them in there, and then that's what you would track. This way, it kind of focuses you on tracking the things that are important to you, as opposed to having your focus in, in a lot of different places. Um, the next thing that kind of comes up now that we know all this is, okay, well, how do I track all of these things? Um, the piece of advice that I have for you is try not to overcomplicate it. Like, you don't have to, especially as a, as a small company or as a company that's just starting out, you don't have to pay a lot of money for for you to track these things. Like if you're saving these things on a database and you're able to query that database, then you're good to go. If, if you're, for example, let's say you're using something like Google Analytics, you can do basically everything that we've discussed on Google Analytics itself. We can kind of see here that we have a, a retention graph uh, presented as a cohort style. Um, we can see how many people are, using, are reaching our uh, conversion goal, which is making a purchase, let's say or even looking at things like activation, which is, which is to say like how many customers that are coming onto the website are actually adding thing, something to the cart. Um, so you can track all these things. Google uh, Analytics is completely free. If you have a Google account, you can just sign up for it and integrate it to your website. 
uh, if you use some of the more well-known um, e-commerce e-commerce solutions like Shopify or, uh, or or basically anything out there will have a plugin for Google Analytics. So you don't have to worry too much about how to integrate it from a technical perspective. Although some level of of basic technical knowledge will probably be really helpful in this case. Um, but again, this is this is a tool that is free and you can integrate it for both apps and websites. So it doesn't have to be uh, only websites. Something that is a little bit more complex, actually a lot, probably a lot more complex and, and it would need somebody who is a, a dedicated person for this is uh, called Tableau. So if you're, if you're running a larger company and you want to be able to put all your metrics in the same place, including things from your database, potentially even things from Google Analytics, from emails and so on and so forth, um, Tableau is a good option probably going to be really expensive. Um, so if you're starting out, I would stay away from this just because it's likely that you don't need this whole thing. Um, a middle place between Tableau and Google Analytics, like if you are trying to pay for something because you want you know, full customization and, and you want to be able to take your data and, and do whatever you want to, you want to do with it, um, it's probably Kissmetrics or Mixpanel. There are other solutions other than these two, so definitely do your research and, and see what works for you. But both of these things allow you to create your own dashboards and fully customize them depending on the data. The way all of these things work is basically you're sending some sort of a signal from your website or from your app to the dashboard that you're subscribed to. So be it Google Analytics or Mixpanel, as soon as somebody adds something to the cart, you're basically saying, hey, send that event to the dashboard that somebody added something to the cart. So ultimately, they all undergo the same level of, of activity and the same level of um, of investment in terms of time. What is different though is um, probably customization and also how much effort and money you're putting into uh, each of these things. Sorry, money, how much money you're putting into each of these things. Um, that brings us to the questions side. Um, so I'm gonna pause here. I can review any of the things that we've discussed previously, um, but we can kind of now have a free form discussion in terms of, of questions and dive deeper into specific things that I might have uh, went over too quickly. Okay, I'm looking at the, I'm looking at the chat now. It looks like everybody's good. Uh, one thing I'll do is I am actually going to share a, uh, a link that has a consolidated view of all of these metrics, including metrics that are non-subscription related specifically for e-commerce. Uh, I think that link would probably be a really good uh, resource for everybody to, to look at a consolidated view of any metric that they can pick from. Just remember that you don't need to track all of these metrics because um, A, you're not gonna have time to do all of that and still pay attention to your customers and B, you don't have to track all of these things. Like it, that's, that's not the point of these metrics. The point is just to give you an indicator of where things are headed. All right. I think, uh, I think we're good here. So I'm happy to stick around for a couple more minutes if somebody thinks of any questions. Otherwise, uh, thank you so much for attending. Uh, I'll make sure to share the slides with you as well as the links that I mentioned and any other resources that might be useful to you.